Hey kids, this is Eric Miller here, and this is now my new carry gun, the brand new Caltech P15. I've already done a breakdown slash explanation of this gun and several videos on the problems I've had with it. If you're interested in that, please go watch those. They were definitely QC issues and not QA issues. Caltech's excellent customer service has fixed it for free and it's running well. And now that I've spent a bit more time with the P15, I think I can go through some of the features and functionality of the gun with a bit more detail and finesse. I'm sorry, this video is going to be super long, but we are taking a really, really deep dive here. I don't know how long it will be as I'm starting to record this, but I can tell you my script is over 6,500 words long. I'm so sorry. At the end of this interminably long torture session, I'm going to have a list of suggestions for Caltech, so hopefully someone there might take a peek at those. So this isn't really a review so much as it is a rundown and an explanation of everything you might want to know about the internals and features of this gun and how I feel about it. So it's totally not a... A review. Actually, I was just at the gun shop and they had the predecessor of this gun for sale, the Caltech P11. Now, this gun was super ahead of its time in terms of size and capacity. However, I can say that just putting it in my hands, it was noticeably wider and heavier than the P15. And the trigger was clearly taken off a staple gun. So while groundbreaking in the 1990s, I wouldn't want this gun today as it's mainly known for its terrible trigger, horrific recoil, and frequent parts breakages. But we might also bring it up again later in conversation in the video. So let's talk specs on the P15. Surprisingly, the weight on the Caltech is exactly as the website says. 14 ounces without the mag and loaded with 15 rounds of 9mm, it's still pretty light. Just as a quick comparison to show how small and light this P15 is, I was able to borrow this Springfield XD 9mm with a 3.3 inch barrel. The original list price on this gun I think was $500, it has a very heavy trigger, the extended single stack magazine has an 8 round capacity and weighs 23 ounces unloaded. No joke, the P15 with 15 rounds in it is still lighter than the XD with 8 rounds in it and you can see they are very nearly the same size. The grip is very small, but with some very aggressive gator grip on it, which is good. The grip module on the gun is super thin, as you can see, making the circumference of this grip probably about the same as a 9mm Glock mag. Uh, if this were a larger gun that I would be shooting a lot for recreational use, this grip is way too harsh. But for a carry gun, you want something that's aggressive and you can keep a good grip on. My outstandingly medium-sized hands fits uh, much better with the back strap attached, and the gun is much more pleasant to shoot with it on. The magazine release is also pretty low profile and a little stiff, which is exactly what you would want on a carry gun, especially one with a magazine disconnect. We will talk more about this little guy later on. Since we're at this end of the gun, let's talk about the magazines. The gun comes with two mags, a flush fit 12 rounder that is also used in the Caltech P11 and the new extended 15 rounder, which Caltech apparently has a patent on. Basically, these are Smith & Wesson model 59 pattern magazines and my Daewoo slash Lionheart mags, which are also 59 pattern mags, run just fine in the gun. But the amazing thing about this gun is this 15 round magazine. Since it was this little extension that was the special sauce to get 15 rounds into this mag, I assume you would be able to buy extensions for these 12 round mags. But no, you can't. There's more to it than that, surprisingly. So here are my three mags that we can take apart and examine and we'll notice some differences. As a side note, these mags are all manufactured by Mechgar. Now this Daewoo slash Lionheart mag is what I would label as an old school pattern magazine. It's pretty similar to the original Smith & Wesson mags, though the base plate is a bit different. It comes apart in a pretty standard manner, and we can see here it has a big long spring and a follower, and this weird little plate thing at the bottom of the spring. Also note that the spring is exactly the same along its entire length. The 12 round P11 P15 mag is pretty similar but with a plain metal plate at the bottom. One major difference we can spot right away is that the spring is narrower at the top of the magazine than it is at the bottom. Now this 15 round P15 mag is a freaking nightmare to get apart and I'm not exactly sure how I did it and I'm never going to do it again. The base plate has this spring-loaded door in the back that keeps it attached to the mag body. The reason why the 12 round mags can't be upgraded with this extension is because the different base plates attach to the mag body differently. 
The 12 rounder's lips go inward, while the lips on the 15 rounder go outward. Now, the mag bodies are identical in length between the, two, the 12 and 15 round mags, and I can't even fit three rounds into this extension piece, so how are these rounds getting in there? Of course, it's the spring. We can see it's different still from the 12 round uh, magazine spring. It's shorter, the narrower part of the top is slightly different, and while you probably can't tell this on camera, the diameter of the 15 round spring is wider than the 12 round spring. So with this cleverly designed base plate and a new spring design, boom, three more rounds into this tiny magazine. At the time of filming, there are no accessories available for the P15 on kel website, which means no extra 15 round mags just now. However, you can buy the 12 rounders from the P11 page, but why on earth would you do that? However, there is something nice from the P11 page that you can pick up for your P15, and that is this pinky extension for the 12 round mags, which I totally bought. The corners here required a little bit of trimming to get it to fit the P15 grip better, but this is a very solid upgrade. Otherwise, I was never going to shoot this gun with my pinky dangling, which means this 12 round mag is now usable. I just thought of this, but these 15 round mags should also fit in the old P11. Now, I don't know a P11 because it's awful, but if you do, once these 15 round P15 mags become available, I think this should be a definite upgrade for it. As a total side note here, on the P11 page, there are also these sleeves that basically extend the grip on the P11 when using it with longer Smith & Wesson mags. I have no idea if Caltech is planning on producing something similar to this for the P15, I kind of doubt it, but I think that's a neat idea. The main problem you're going to have when using the longer Smith & Wesson mags in the P11 or P15 is that there is a danger of over travel when inserting the mag. These uh, sleeve things would prevent that. In something like the P11, if you smack this log magazine in, you could get it very jammed up and damage the magazine lips. In the P15, there might also be the danger of damaging the magazine's safety, whether or not it was activated at the time. So just be careful if you're using a mag longer than was intended for the gun. Moving up, the trigger is extremely nice for a striker gun. There's some take up, and then there's this area of very smooth sponge, and then it just breaks. It reminds me of one of those older SIG triggers where the trigger doesn't hit a wall or anything, it just kind of breaks in the middle of this sponge. Uh, I can understand how some people wouldn't like that, but man, I really like it. And so has everyone else who has handled this gun so far. On my example, I've measured the trigger pull pretty consistently between four and three quarters and five and one quarters pounds. Because of how smooth the trigger pull is, and because there's no wall, it does give you the feeling that it's a bit lighter than that. Now, all the videos I saw of this gun from Shock Cho 2022, the reviewer mentioned a very long reset on the trigger. My trigger isn't quite like that. I think it's possible that Caltech adjusted it prior to going into production. But either way, it's a carry gun and I'm not interested in maximizing my split times. The reset is totally fine. The other thing I can note is that the trigger itself is machined aluminum and the smooth, tactile feeling you get fine Corinthian leather. just feels so great. If all you've ever used are crunchy plastic triggers with a dingus, this is a new day for you, my friend. The trigger is definitely one of the major highlights of this gun. We've got a pick rail for a light or laser. I probably won't be carrying this with a light, but I like to have that option. James mentioned in his TFBTV review that this gun is very easy to inertia charge, meaning slamming a mag into the gun is often enough to dislodge the slide release and send the slide forward. This is true. We can see that the slide stop does not have very far to travel, so a good smack can get it to come down. That's good. The other thing I can say here is that the slide release is also very nice. It's very low profile, but it's also very easy to use. Unlike some other slide releases out there, where it doesn't matter how large the gun is, they can still be a bit fiddly to manipulate. And I'm totally not naming any names here, like I don't know, Glock. The sights are also a big highlight for me. They're all three glow-in-the-dark tritium night sights with a white ring around the front sight, making it very easy to pick up. The rear sight is adjustable for windage and elevation, and this whole bl back plastic block is removable, and kel uh, should have metal replacement plates for it to mount an optic on it at some point in the future. There's more going on here with this rear sight and this block, and we'll talk some more about that uh, a little bit later. 
The front sight is also a high-vis green light pipe. Now the question you might have is, do you really want a high-vis front sight on your carry gun? Especially one made by kel -Tec? Because just like you, I've seen plenty of videos of these little light pipes popping out of much more expensive guns from just looking at them too hard, let alone from carrying them and shooting them. Well, you can take a look at this little guy and decide on that for yourself. The front sight that is holding the light pipe is entirely metal and appears very sturdy to me. Also, because it's dovetailed into the slide, I would assume that at some point in the future there might be some replacement sights available if you don't like this one. The slide on this gun is a little longer than other similar guns in this category. This is good and bad. The bad is that the gun is pretty flippy when fired. You have a small grip to control the gun with, and this long slide just wants to jump up when, it, when you fire. Uh, you can see from kel own demo video that the front of this gun does like to flip up a bit when firing. The good though is twofold. First is the longer 4-inch barrel. You should get better ballistic performance than with most other subcompact or microcompact guns, most of which sport barrels in the 3 to 3.5-inch three range. Now, something I learned recently is that 4 inches is the SAMI spec barrel length for 9mm. That means if the barrel is shorter than 4 inches, your 9mm ammo won't perform as well as Sammy says it should. That's a good thing to keep in mind when you're concerned about hollow point expansion. I was recently at a Cabela's and they had a large selection of most of the popular pistols for sale right now, and I thought I would take note of which 9mm guns also had 4 inch barrels. I didn't include guns with barrels longer than 4 inches. Now, if we take a look at this list here, we can see that none of these guns are particularly small. There are a couple of compact size guns here, like the G19 and the P10C, but if I were asked to describe any of these guns as small or petite or easily concealable, I really couldn't point to any of them. Uh, they're all kind of normal sized guns as far as I'm concerned, and several of them are duty sized pistols. So the four inch barrel on this tiny little P15 becomes that much more impressive. At least to me. Another benefit here is the long sight radius you'll get from this slide. The further the front and rear sights are from one another, the easier it is to make hits. And here we've got about five and a quarter inches between the front and the rear sights. For comparison, that's just a hair shorter than the sights on this full-size Police Duty Walther P5. Since we're talking about ammo, the manual states to only use SAMI spec ammo, which I guess means plus P is acceptable, but it also specifies to only use brass cased ammo. No steel, polymer, or aluminum cased ammo is allowed. How much of that statement is out of real concern for the operation of the gun, and how much of it is CYA legal speak, I couldn't say. But don't tell Caltech because I did run some aluminum cased ammo through this gun. However, in the future, I promise I will keep it to just brass cased stuff, probably. For right now, I'm going to be carrying it with Hornady FTX Standard Pressure 115 grain ammo, as that's what I've tested it with already, and it appears to be working fine. But you should always test whatever ammo you're going to be carrying in your own gun. What I'd really like to try is that lightweight, high-velocity Liberty Civil Defense ammo, if I can ever get my hands on that stuff. I think it would be especially interesting in this gun for, one, the longer barrel, and two, reducing the weight of the loaded gun even more. So that is a possible video for the future. Slide serrations are very good. They're aggressive without cutting your fingers or snagging on things. The gun I ended up with has a parkerized slide, but there is also a blued version of this slide. I prefer this parkerized finish as I think it will wear much better than the kel bluing will. For example, the barrel is blued, but just barely. Um, if you think I've worked this poor barrel over pretty hard to get it to look like this, I can tell you this is exactly how it looked new out of the box. I mean, it did get test fired at the factory before shipping, and this is how I got it. So if you plan to actually carry this gun and not just have it lying around somewhere, I think the parkerized finish might be the better way to go. But hey, I have no real expertise in this matter, so... Time will tell. Since we're here looking, we can see a tactile loaded chamber indicator, and we'll see how that works when we take this back cover off in a little bit. Also, there is a viewing window in the side of the breech to see if a round is actually in there. No need for press checks times two. The other thing I can mention is the lockup here is really solid. I can move the barrel here just, just barely, teeny tiny bit. To disassemble, you'll need to pull the trigger like many other striker fired guns. Then you'll need to take the magazine out Pull the slide back a little bit and you can see right here the P15 has a notch in the slide that tells you exactly where to put it. And then there's a little groove cut out in the slide release 
That should perfectly fit, fit a spent 9mm case, which you could then use to pry it out. If you have everything in exactly the right spot, this comes out and goes back together very easily. This slide should then just come off the front. We've got two nested and captive recoil springs here around a metal, and I believe it's aluminum, rod. This is very nice, first, that the rod is metal, and second, that we've got two recoil springs here, which definitely go a long way to taming this gun's recoil. You can also notice we have some very long rails here on the chassis. Also, most polymer striker guns today, you just get four little nubs. And I will take big long rails any day, steel or no. What I really love about these internals is that they're not just a copy of a Glock, like most other new guns are these days. However, I know many people will have questions about the long-term durability of an aluminum chassis and aluminum slide rails. I think these are good points to consider. I was thinking about it myself when it hit me. I've got this Walther P1 Bundeswehr standard issue, and it has an aluminum frame and aluminum rails. And so does this P5, which was widely adopted by police departments around Europe. And so does this Lionheart LH9, which is just a cosmetically enhanced version of the Daewoo K5 standard issue of the South Korean military. And these are literally three police and military duty guns I had lying around my house just now. So should these aluminum rails on this P15 concern you? Uh, you may allow anything to concern you that you feel you should be concerned by. It was never an issue in some of these other duty guns I have, some of which I have thousands of rounds through. So as of right now, I'm not worried. Five years from now, I might change my mind, but right now, I'm okay with this. A lot of people have questions about the safeties and how they work and how they get disconnected. One question I've seen is, if I have the safeties deactivated, how do I know they won't accidentally reactivate themselves? Good question. So let's take a look at what's going on inside here. Back in the frame, you have a flat-headed screw thing, and if you turn that screw clockwise, you can change which mode the gun is in. And there are three. Mode one means both grip safety and magazine safety are on. Mode two means both of these safeties are off. And mode three reactivates the grip safety but keeps the mag safety off. So what's happening when these modes are being changed? Let's start with the mag safety. This inside bar is the ejector, and the bar on the outside is the mag safety. When it is in a downward pointing position, it prevents the gun from firing. Inserting the magazine will push the bar up, making the gun active. This is how it will behave in mode one. The magazine needs to be inserted in order to make the gun active. So if we turn the key from mode one to mode two, what's happening inside the gun? This selector switch rod has flat and rounded areas across it and is under a fair bit of tension from a spring roughly in the middle there. There are three flat edges on this rod that that spring will rest in. The only way for the gun to change what mode it's in and which safeties are on and off is if this spring were not in correct contact with this rod. Uh, and it's in there pretty good. The left side of this rod will change what the mag safety is doing. Switching it from mode one to two, we can see that the safety bar is being forced up into the active position, and it can't be made to move down. When we move from mode three back into mode one, the safety bar is released and will keep the gun disabled until a magazine is inserted. Similar things are happening with the grip safety, though it's a little harder to see. When we change modes, we can see here on the right side of the selector bar, this little hand thingy, which is part of the grip safety. Uh, it will move front or back a little bit depending on the shape of the selector bar. This will activate or deactivate the grip safety. Also, when it's deactivated, the button on the back of the grip will retract most of the way. As a side note here about the grip safety, I demonstrated in an earlier video that this button only needs to be depressed about 80% of the way for it to make the gun active. I see this as a positive, since if I had to pull the gun while carrying it, I might not have time or opportunity to get a super perfect grip on the gun, which some other grip safeties might be touchy about. For the P15, I know I just need a grip that is 80% of the way there to deactivate this safety. So to answer the question about this uh, gun spontaneously changing which mode it's in and which safeties are on or off, uh, is that I personally see very little danger of that happening. The only way it could happen is if something happened to the spring, or maybe if the whole rod were to break or something like that. Uh, but I think you could say that about half the parts on any gun anyway. So looking at it from the outside, some might assume that this is just a screw, and if the screw comes loose, the safeties will go all haywire. Uh, and as I've shown here, the operation is quite a bit different than that. Okay, so what happens if I turn off the mag and grip safety? I mean, there's no trigger dingus. So how safe is this gun going to be? 
Well, this is pretty interesting. Probably. To see the striker safety, uh, we come back to this cover. If we take these four screws out, we can remove the cover. Now, I will tell you that this cover thing is on here really good. It's also being held in place by a big leaf spring. So it might take a little bit of work to wiggle it off. I also need to say that this particular plastic uh, is a bit on the brittle side, and I have cracked it once already when the slide slipped and fell onto a hard floor. So don't try and crank this out of here with a screwdriver or something as you're liable to break it, I think. Once off, the loaded chamber indicator will just fall out, so be careful not to lose it. As a side note, leaving this indicator out when reassembling this won't affect the operation of the gun, but I think it's a really nice feature to have. This leaf spring here is what acts on the chamber indicator to keep it pushed down when the chamber is empty. So, on the back of the slide we have this big greasy spring, and what it does is keep the striker safety active, which means it prevents the striker from moving all the way forward unless the trigger is pulled. Let's see how that works. We can see that I'm pushing the striker as far forward as I can, but the end of the striker is only coming up flush to the breech face. It's not extending past that, and therefore will not set off a chambered round. So how is this happening? The silver piece is preventing the striker from moving forward. So how do we get this thing out of the way so the gun will fire? Here's the frame in the sear. When you pull the trigger, the rear part drops and the front part rises up. The rear part of the sear is the part that fits into this shelf on the striker. It holds the striker back when it's cocked, and then as the trigger is pulled, it then releases the striker. Easy peasy. Now the important part is what this extrusion on the front of the sear is doing. As the striker is being released in the rear, this bump pushes up on the striker safety, moving it out of the way and allowing the striker to move forward all the way through the breech face to hit the primer on the cartridge. So let's say we have a worst case scenario where either this end of the sear spontaneously breaks or this shelf on the end of the striker breaks or I don't know, something just like that. The striker will spring forward, but unless the trigger is pulled and this little bump moves this silver piece out of the way, the gun will not fire. I think this whole trigger system is a work of art. The disconnecting safeties, the internal trigger pull safety without the use of an obnoxious trigger dingus, all with an honestly amazing trigger pull, I find really astounding. If all that came out of this gun was this trigger system, that would be pretty impressive. One extra bit of info about this striker is that the first time I took it apart, I ran a cotton swab down this channel and a ton of this gold colored material came out. I have no idea what this is or where it came from, but I would recommend you clean this out if you purchase <laughs> one of these new. That's about all I have to explain about this gun. Let me know if you have any more questions in the comments. And now a word from our sponsor. Snake and Rake. You bring the rakes, we've got the snakes. We skip leg day every day. So you can take all the snakes you can rake for only $14.99 per person. Snake and Rake. Rake in the fun. Thanks. Now, we're going to talk about some suggestions for kel -Tec. I have two issues here that I believe are QA issues, not QC issues, which means it doesn't have to do with how these parts were manufactured, but that they weren't designed quite properly. And I have two other kind of weird issues to discuss about the magazines. Also, I am not a mechanical engineer, nor am I a gunsmith, so please take this for what it's worth which might be nothing. Uh, but with that said, I do hope someone from Caltech will give this a watch, um, but I have no way of ensuring that, so we'll see. Suggestion number one for Caltech, this mag release needs fixing. As of right now, you can see that if I push this mag release in too far, the whole thing will pop out into the mag well. So this is possible to do while changing mags, which then makes the gun inoperable. You can't really get it back into the gun without disassembling this part with an Allen wrench and then screwing it back together. So what's the problem? We can see here that the end of this mag release is very thin, which means that if you depress the mag release too far, it will just dive straight into the mag well. Some possible solutions uh, would be to make this frame area here thicker, or to lengthen this post on the back side of the button. Either action would help to prevent the button from going in too far. Of course, both of those solutions require remaking the molds that these come out of, which is a very expensive and time-consuming process and is probably just not gonna happen. The easier and basically free solution Caltech could implement would be to make the outside of this end of the metal piece wider. Just enough to make it sit flush with these gator grips I think would be enough to prevent 
it from popping into the magwell accidentally. So a very small change to how this part is machined, and I think this problem would be solved. Now, if no one at Keltec has heard about this problem uh, yet, or and or have not thought of this solution already, I would gladly take payment in the receipt of one new redesigned mag release. You're welcome. The second problem I don't really have a specific solution for, I can just tell you it needs redesigning. I usually hate three dot sights, but these are great. I love these sights. But the way the rear sight is mounted in here does not work very well. So this is how it works. The sight has a spring on the front, which allows you to adjust the Y axis or height of the sight with this set screw in the back. That part is fine. However, to adjust the X axis, some weird stuff is going on here. First, the sight has a spring loaded plunger off the right side, which will put the, push the sight to the left constantly. When you screw this long screw in, there are some threads on this plastic cover, uh, which mine are already stripped, and then it goes into this side of the sight, which looks completely smooth. Well, if you look at it from the left side, you can see that there are a few threads there. So what is happening here is screwing this in will pull the sight to the right, while the plunger will push the sight to the left. Theoretically, this should allow you to adjust the sight left or right. The problem is, is that it doesn't seem to really work all that great. Uh, first, of course, once you get these sights lined up, you should put a little dab of blue Loctite on both the X and the Y screws so that they stay there. But beyond that, I had a lot of trouble getting this sight aligned correctly in the X direction. No matter how I adjust it, it always shoots to the right as you can see from my targets on multiple range trips. I've also played with this at home with a laser bullet thing and it's always showing that yes, the sight is off. I think with some more careful tinkering and some Loctite, I think I can get this sight in the right place, but I feel the concept here is, is just not working. It's clever like a lot of other features on the gun, but hey, they can't all be winners. As James said in his TFB TV review, I'm not doing long distance target shooting with this gun. I just want to carry it so I don't get stabbed by a crack hobo. My humble opinion is that the sights should be aligned left and right at the factory and stake there somehow. However, I personally feel like the ability to adjust the height as some people like their guns to shoot high or low and will also shoot higher or lower depending on the ammo you're using. I think that's kind of good. How you would fix any of this I have no idea. The other difficulty is working with this plastic cover. These threads strip like immediately and over tightening this screw could crack this back cover. So yee, I don't know. As a crazy idea, maybe an upgrade Keltec could offer would be that these rear sights, but mounted in a machined metal cover like the red dot sights will likely be. I haven't had my hands on one of those aluminum framed guns, but from some pictures I've seen, it looks like that gun comes with an, a machined aluminum back cover. If you don't put a red dot on this gun, uh, I would love to upgrade it with that machined cover instead. In short, I love these sights, just not the way they're attached to this cover. Lastly, let's talk about these mags. In my opinion, this pinky extension on the 15 rad mag is just set a little too far back. As I grip the gun, I like having the extension there, but because of where it is, I feel like my pinky has no strength or leverage to grip it well. If it came forward just a little bit, I think my pinky would be able to get a better grip and would give me a little better control over the gun. Maybe that's a little nitpicky and maybe it's just my pathetically weak hands, but I feel I get a much better grip on the gun with the P11 pinky extension. Now here's the other weird mag thing, which I think could be a problem in the future. I got the P11 pinky extension for the 12 round mag and I started experiencing a very strange issue. I didn't experience it sooner because I knew I wasn't going to use it, so I didn't really play around with the 12 round mag before this. But when I insert the mag, if it is slightly tilted forward, the front of the mag gets hung up on the chassis and won't go in. So even pushing the mag straight up from the bottom will sometimes get it caught and it's really stuck. If we open up the gun here, we can see exactly where it's getting caught, right here at the bottom of the chassis. I never experienced this with the 15 round mag, but now that I know this can happen, and if I try really hard, I can induce the same problem with the 15 round mag also. However, it's not stuck in there hardcore like the 12 round mag is. It's really strange. Anyway, I think it may be possible to ameliorate this issue in the future fairly simply if this corner right here on the frame were beveled slightly, which would allow the mags to slide past it. 
So why this happens with the 12 round mags and not the 15 round ones, I don't know. The mag bodies appear to me to be identical. Another option is that this is specific only to my gun and that other people may not be experiencing this issue at all. Please leave a comment below if you can get this to happen in your P15 with the 12 round mag. Okay, so we've made it to the end. Let's talk turkey. The current MSRP for the P15 is $450. Nonetheless, I was extraordinarily lucky and was able to pick this one up at k-var.com. I'd never heard of them before. They are not a sponsor. Uh, for only $310. That is no joke. Plus $20 for shipping and another $20 at $25 at the gun store for the transfer. So out the door, $355. I am extraordinarily happy with that, and I would say that if you can't get this gun for less than $400 out the door, you should maybe start looking at something else. Because once you hit that $400 threshold, uh, you're getting into some uh, higher-end guns, like the Mossberg MC2C SC2, 2, 2 S, SC2, or the Masada Slim. Uh, though they won't be quite as light or as thin or have all the features the P-15 has, they're much more in the normal gun territory. And I understand that kel crazy space guns uh, kind of weird some people out. So if the P-15 isn't your thing, uh, that's totally fine. And I suggest you checking out either of those two guns first. So what is the future for the P-15? I'm sure it will be very popular, not just with kel P-9 and P-11 fans, but everyone who I have let handle this gun has been extremely impressed with it for the weight, the slimness, the trigger, the sights, and the capacity. And those are a lot of strong positives all in one gun for under $400. Now, will there be other versions of it? Well, there is the aluminum frame version, which costs twice as much as the polymer one and still weighs about the same, which I think is pretty cool. But actually, when the gun was debuted at the 2022 SHOT Show, I scoured the internet and I think I watched every single interview that kel did in their booth. And in one of them, and only in this one video, someone from kel I think it was Chad, uh, let it slip that they have planned a smaller and a larger version of this gun. Now, they probably weren't supposed to say that, and they didn't give any details, but if that is true, what might those two versions of the gun be? Well, the only area on this gun that could be made much smaller is the barrel and the slide. I think you could cut this down by probably half an inch to three quarters of an inch, which would make this a very pocketable gun. I think the major downside to this, besides losing the sight radius, is that you would also be losing a significant portion of the recoil spring, meaning this would probably kick super hard. As for making it larger, obviously we can easily make a longer grip, similar to the P365XL, which I think would also be cool. Uh, this might have a 17 or 18 round mag in it, making it another very strong contender in this class of guns, I think. Now, the funny thing about this larger pistol concept is that all that's really changing here is the grip module, uh, which is not the serialized part. A larger grip frame could be offered by kel uh, to existing P15 owners to upgrade for themselves, or at least theoretically. Pop out these three torque screws, pop the chassis out, drop it into the new larger frame, and then of course you would need uh, new longer magazines to fit in the new longer frame, of course. These are just my quickie artist renditions of what I would imagine a line of P15 uh, pistols might look like. Uh, will kel ever put something like this out? I have no idea, but if they do, we can see how close I was. For now, I'm happy with what I have, and as soon as kel starts putting out those red dot covers, I will likely get one and uh, throw a Holosun 407K on there. Some people may look at this and say, wow, what a crazy disaster this gun is. Aluminum this, plastic that, blah, blah, blah. Well, all I can say is that all firearms are always juggling a set of trade-offs, especially, especially when they get this small. Giving up one thing to get more of something else. The question you need to ask yourself is, are the things I'm gaining in this compromise greater than the things I'm giving up for the job I need this gun to do. The clear design goals for this gun were to make it as small and as light as possible to make it easier to carry on a regular basis while simultaneously giving a capacity sufficient that the owner wouldn't feel obligated to always lug around an extra magazine with them. Given that design concept, 
and all the really nice features this gun comes with as standard, like the sights, the great trigger, etc., I'm personally okay with whatever I might be losing with a larger gun, such as reduced recoil and better control with a larger grip. I'm certainly not losing much on capacity, accuracy, sights, trigger, optics, lights, etc. But that is a cost-benefit analysis you will need to do for yourself. As I've said in my other videos, this is very early days with this gun, and we'll just have to wait and see how the accessories and other people's experiences shake out with it. Anyway, this has been Eric Miller. Thank you very much for sticking around all the way until the end, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Uh, stay safe and have fun, kids. You know, I was at Costco the other day and I saw a guy wearing a utility kilt. Are those still a thing? I mean, are people still wearing these? I, I, I don't get out much.